promises in JavaScript are known to be a little daunting, intimidating, annoying, I don't know, whatever negative thing you want to say about them. But I promise you that once you understand what happens behind the scenes, under the hood, they're actually not that complicated. So today I want to walk you through promise execution and see what happens behind the scenes when we interact and work with promises. So one way to create a promise is by using the new promise constructor. And this constructor also receives an executor function. Now, when the new promise constructor is executed, a new promise object is created in memory. And this object contains some internal slots like the promise state, promise result, promise fulfill reactions, promise reject reactions, and promise is handled. We also get some additional functionality to either resolve or reject this promise. Now we can resolve this promise by calling resolve, which is made available to us by the executor function. And when we call resolve, the promise state is set to fulfilled and the promise result is set to the value that we pass to resolve. So the string done in this case. Similarly, we can reject the promise by calling reject, in which case the promise state is set to rejected and the promise result is set to the value that we pass to reject. So the string fail. Cool, nothing special here. We're just calling a function to change some object property. So what's so special about promises? Well, that's actually in those two fields that we skipped so far. So in the promise fulfill reactions and the promise reject reactions, because these fields contain something called promise reaction records. We can create a promise reaction record by chaining a then or a catch method to the promise. So whenever we chain then, the then method is responsible for creating the promise reaction record. And among many other fields, this reaction record contains a handler. And this has some code. And that code is that callback that we pass to then. Now what happens is that whenever we resolve the promise, so we call resolve, resolve is added to the call stack, the promise state is set to fulfilled, promise result is set to the value that we pass to resolve, and the promise reaction records handler receives that promise result, so the string done in this case. And the handler is now added to the microtask queue. This is where the asynchronous part of promises comes into play. And just kind of as a quick refresher, um, whenever the call stack is empty, the event loop first checks in the microtask queue. And whenever this queue is empty, it goes to the task queue, also called like the callback queue, macro task queue, whatever you want to call it. What's important here is that the microtask queue gets priority. Now, so far, I've only been calling resolve and reject synchronously, like right in the promise constructor. But usually you want to initiate some kind of asynchronous task in this constructor. With an asynchronous task, I mean anything off the main thread. So reading something from a file system or a network request or something as simple as a timer. Whenever they return that data, we can use their callback function to either resolve with the data that they returned or reject if an error occurred. So just to keep it simple, <laughs> let's uh, see how the execution goes for this promise constructor. So we have the promise constructor that has a set timeout and we also have a then handler. Let's just go through it step by step and see what happens. So first, the new promise constructor is added to the call stack and this creates the promise object. The executor function is called and on the first line we have that set timeout. So set timeout is added to the call stack and this one is responsible for scheduling that timer. In this case, 100 milliseconds. And this has that callback that we pass to set timeout. So the function that eventually calls resolve. Then on the next line, we have the then handler. So then is added to the call stack and this is responsible for creating that promise reaction record. So this creates a promise reaction record with a callback that we provided as its handler. Now then is popped off the call stack and let's just imagine that those 100 milliseconds are up now. So the callback that we passed to set timeout is now added to the task queue. There's nothing on the call stack anymore, script is finished. So it can now go from the task queue to the call stack. And this now calls resolve. So this changes the promise state to fulfilled, the promise result to the string done, and it schedules that handler to the micro task queue. Resolve is now done, popped off the call stack, so is the callback, and there's again nothing on the call stack. So the event loop first checks the micro task queue. Well, there are handler is waiting, so the handler is added to the call stack, and this then console logs the promise result, which is the string done. Now, the nice thing about the fact that it's added to the micro task queue is that in the meantime, our script can just keep running. It can just keep performing important tasks, and it stays interactive. Only when the call stack is empty, so when there's like nothing important to do, does it get added to the call stack from the micro task queue. So this means that we can handle the promise result in a non-blocking way. Now, another cool thing is that then itself also returns a promise. So besides just creating that promise reaction record, it also creates a promise object. So, and this allows us to kind of chain those thens to each other and have this incremental promise results uh, 
ha handling. So let's just see what happens when we have this code snippet. So the first we have the new promise constructor, which creates that promise object. This immediately resolves with one. So the state is set to fulfilled and promise result is one. Then we call the then handler. So this creates a promise reaction record with, with the handler being results and then it returns result times two. Result being that promise result, which is the number one. But it also creates a promise object. And this is now set to fulfilled because we returned result times two. Result being one, so result times two is two. And we do the same on the next line. So we have another then. This creates a promise reaction record again with the exact same handler. So result times two, this time result being two. So two times two is four. So this promise result is now four. And then we have one more and this just logs that value. So again, the state is set to fulfilled. In this case, the result is undefined because we didn't return a value, we're only logging it. But in the console, you will see four. So that's just something to keep in mind. We can chain those thens together and kind of incrementally handle that promise result in a non-blocking way. Now, of course, in a real application, you won't use numbers like this, but instead you want to incrementally handle that promise result. Maybe you have some kind of image that you first want to resize and then add a filter and then change the format. I don't know what you want to do with an image, but you can do all that by chaining this then in a non-blocking way. And that's pretty cool. That's pretty, pretty powerful. All right. So let's see how well you understand promises, or at least how well I explained it. So pause this video real quick and see if you know how these numbers get logged. All right, so if you guessed one, three, two, then congrats, you understood it perfectly. Or it's a lucky guess, I don't know, but let's see how this happened. So first we have the new promise constructor again, added to the call stack, new promise object is created. Then we have the executor function, which gets added to the call stack. And on the very first line, we have console log one. This gets added to the call stack and this logs one. Then we call resolve with two. So now the promise state is changed to fulfilled. The promise result is set to two. And we don't have a promise fulfill reaction yet. That only happens on the next line. Resolve is popped off the call stack. So is the executor function and the new promise constructor. Now on the next line, we finally have then. So this creates that promise reaction record. Um, it doesn't get added to that list because the promise is already resolved. This would just take up unnecessary memory, but it still has access to that promise result. So this promise reaction record has the handler with the result being two and then console log result. So this is immediately added to the microtask queue. It's important to remember that it's not immediately executed. No, it is immediately scheduled to the microtask queue. Then we go to the next line because our script isn't done yet. The call stack isn't empty yet. And there we just call console log three in a normal way. So this is added to the call stack logs three. So now we have one three. Now, finally, our script is done. There's nothing on the call stack. So the first task in the micro task queue is added to the call stack, which is that then handler, which then console logs the result being two. So now finally two gets logged. Hopefully my explanation kind of helped to demystify promises at least a little bit. Um, I also have a written blog post in the description if you prefer to just read it. Uh, I also added a, a link to the ECMA spec if you're like me and like to just read the specification for the technologies that we're working with. And if you want more kind of questions like this, I have a front of master's course also linked below where I have a bunch of questions about JavaScript internals and also kind of explanations like this one. So you can test your JavaScript knowledge and uh, maybe learn something new. Thanks and have fun coding. <laughs>